Hey everybody, how's it going? This is Our House 21, and I just wanted to do a quick video. Um, well, accomplishing a couple of things here. Uh, first off, I want to show everybody the progress I've made with the new Ofna body. Now, for those of you in the know, this is actually an Ofna DM1 body that I, you know, decided to. Well, it's an alternate body for my new RC, which you guys saw in the previous video. But I decided to, you know, just basically do it all up, follow the same essential color scheme. You know, using my good copper head orange color. But, you know, do it up so that it's unmistakable that this is a Traxxas model. But, also just, you know, add a little, a little bit of my personal flair to it. So I think that the body came out really nicely. And the other interesting thing that you'll notice here is these wheels. These are actually the same wheels that you guys saw destroyed and blown out the smithereens in my high speed carnage video. So just as a goof, you know, I was sitting around with the hot glue gun and said, you know what, let's see what happens. And <laughs> amazingly enough, I put these things together um, with the hot glue gun and I did a bench test, spinning them up to the full speed of the car <laughs> and they held together perfectly. And, um, and they even maintained a pretty decent semblance of balance. So I was able to take them together, well, take them out, run them around, do a little testing, and they work. Now, I would not try to use these for a max speed, like 100 mile an hour run anymore. However, for just throwing on to try to test out the basic configuration and, you know, you know, these are perfectly good runners to just shake out the vehicle a little bit before I put the uh, pristine high-speed tires on and uh, see what the thing can do. But I was actually pleasantly surprised. You know, like I said, I'm not, I wouldn't trust them above or like they say about 60 miles an hour, but hey, <laughs> they're free, you know, so I can't complain at all. So anyway, back to the meat of what this video is all about. Uh, I entitled this one right here, um, High Speed Facts and Aerodynamics 101. So now we guys like to throw around, you know, the 100 mile an hour number a lot, you know, uh, the 100 mile an hour club, you know, so on and so forth. But a lot of us never really sit down to think about what that really means, because when you start moving at 100 miles an hour, you know, you change into a completely different regime of operating an RC car and you have to transition. Actually, you have to transition between a couple of regimes in order to get your vehicle stable and functional. So, I mean, so little things that don't matter when you're going around at parking lot speeds, you know, uh, just out of the box RTR, 30 or 40 miles an hour, become huge when you start to approach, you know, the much higher speeds. So, just kind of jumping in, um, let's let's hit some simple facts. So, if you take your hand, which for the sake of conversation here, let's just call this about 30 square inches. And you stuck your hand out of a car window at 30 miles an hour, which is pretty fast. You know, it's uh, at 30 miles an hour, you're actually traveling 44 feet per second. You know, but you didn't think you were covering that much distance, huh? And then you actually feel on your hand a dynamic pressure of about 0 0.01 pounds per square inch. So basically one just about a hundredth of a pound per square inch. So, you know, you're actually feeling something about a half a pound of pressure on your foot, I mean, on your hand. If it was foot, that'd be different. Okay, so, but as you, as you increase in speed, you know, that pressure that you feel is actually dependent upon the square of the velocity you travel. So at 40 miles an hour, for example, you're actually traveling at 60 feet per second. 60 miles an hour and it jumps up to 88 feet per second at 80 miles an hour now you're traveling at 117 feet per second you know jumped all the way to 100 miles an hour now you are going at 156 feet per second that's half a football field per second so the pressure that you're going to feel against your hand also increases you know with the double of that so um so at 40 miles an hour, you're actually gonna be feeling about just shy of a pound on your hand. 
out the window. At 50 miles an hour, it's about 1.3 pounds. At 60 miles an hour, now it's just about two pounds. At 80 miles an hour, you're feeling about three and a half pounds on your hands sticking out of a car window. Jump that to 100 miles an hour, that's five and a half pounds. Go all the way to 120 miles an hour, now you're feeling just shy of eight pounds on your hand, you know, based upon the dynamic pressure of the air pushing back on your hand traveling at those speeds. So if you just think about that, if you're doing a speed run and you're documenting with GPS, GPS updates at a frequency of about one hertz. Uh, that's, you know, so one GPS sample per second. So to get a good run, you probably want to want to spend two or three seconds at your maximum speed. In that two or three seconds, you've covered a distance of one and a half football fields or 450 feet. So you've got your acceleration, your deceleration area. So probably multiply that by between two or three. So now you're talking about needing an air, well, needing a, a, a run up and spin down area of between a thousand and fifteen hundred feet, you know, maybe even more than that. So, you know, you're, you're quickly approaching, um, you know, in order to really have a good amount of area to, to maneuver, to compensate, you know, needing something along the lines of between a tenth and a quarter of a mile straight away in order to really feel comfortable that your vehicle, you know, has enough room to maneuver. These are pretty significant areas and quite frankly, it's pretty tough to find a, a place that has, you know, A, is off of public roads that has a very well um, manicured parking lot, for example, or a, a very smooth surface that your car won't get crushed in traffic. So it, scouting locations becomes a really big deal. And then once you have your location, you also need to be really concerned about obstructions in that location. Because if you notice, um, and I'll jump into the, the math here in just a second, but in order to make the car perform aerodynamically, you really want to limit the amount of area or the amount of, uh, the amount of space available for air to get underneath the car. And so you have to set the car up pretty low ground clearance. So you've got to do a fod walk, that's what we call it in the aviation world, where you have to basically walk the whole surface and make sure there's no foreign object debris that's in that area. Now this is large rocks, um, trash, anything that can get across the area that can then get in underneath your car, underneath your tires that can offset, upset it, that might send it airborne. Um, and, um, and that's part of just self-preservation for your vehicle, uh, but also to you know make sure that you have a good surface for your tires to grip onto. Because when you start talking about those high speeds, you know, for a vehicle like this, I'm estimating that I'm gonna be uh, at 100 miles an hour, I should have about six pounds, six and a half pounds of drag uh, using a, uh, well, that's using a body like this. Well, honestly, because aerodynamically, even though this ProLine high flow body isn't too bad, it's not a body that you want to try to take that fast. You know, this, you want something like this. So this is more like, should be about five pounds. Um, however, uh, there's a wrinkle to that. That's five pounds clean without a spoiler. And I'll get to the spoiler in just a little bit. So let's go ahead and just start looking at, you know, some of the relationships and, um, you know, just laying out, you know, what all this stuff, uh, like why, this becomes important and you know what the um you know what the ramifications are as far as uh, rc cars at speed so basically everything in aerodynamics or i won't say everything but a lot of aerodynamic principles boil down to the bernoulli principle so in essence bernoulli says that mass flow for fluid and air is a fluid. Air is actually an incompressible fluid. So another term for subsonic uh, aerodynamics is also hydrodynamics because air acts like thin water. So it's an incompressible fluid. You, uh, uh, so under normal conditions, it doesn't 
uh, really contract or expand very much given input. So it actually makes the math pretty easy to deal with. But anyway, so mass, fl mass flow in an incompressible fluid remains constant uh, regardless of the area of the uh, of the space that is going with that. What that means is that let's say you have a tube that starts off with a large diameter. Think about like a set of PVC pipe and you have a neck down where um, it now constricts to a smaller area. The mass flow, so the amount of actual air molecules that's going through this tube is going to remain constant, you know, over the length of the tube. So what that means is that if you have an area of this size on the size of the tube, and this drawing is not the scale, but don't, don't get hung up on that. But if you have an area over here of a certain amount at a given velocity going through, once it necks down, if this is one half the area, the air is not going to be moving at twice the velocity because that mass flow has to be the same. What that means for aerodynamics is that the pressure in that incompressible fluid also changes, but it changes with the square of the velocity. So I'll just, I'll get to this over here in a sec. So what that means is that if you look at a pressure drop for, um, let's say if you take that fluid and you um, speed it up, the static pressure within that airflow actually drops and the drop is proportional to the square of that velocity. So this says your change in pressure is proportional to one half rho, that's the density of air, times the, the square of the velocity that the air is moving. So putting in terms of aircraft, and this is actually how we generate lift in airplanes. Let's, uh, jumping up here, spoiler. A lot of people think that lift is generated by air hitting a surface and then pushing off of it in one direction or another. So if you had a wing that's flying, let's say this wing at this angle and air is coming in and hitting it, they think the molecules hitting the bottom of the wing push the wing up. And th there is a little bit of that, but that's not how it really works. Really, lift is generated because you have air flowing over an aerodynamic surface. And in order, so if you have two sides, a flat bottom like this, and a curved surface on the top, in order for the molecules on the top surface to make it over and meet back up with their friends on the bottom that are going over the same free stream velocity, it, this, these molecules actually have to speed up. That speeding up causes a pressure drop, which is what you see here, which is, uh, like I said, proportional to the square of the change of velocity due to the molecule speeding up in order to cover this larger amount of distance versus these guys. So the pressure on this side becomes lower than the pressure on this side. That results in the net force up, and that generates lift. So the lift of an aerodynamic body is now proportional to that change in pressure times the area, in this case I have a wing, that's the area of this aerodynamic body. So putting that into context for a vehicle, if let's say you have this nominal pickup truck shape, you hear molecules and pickup trucks have high ground clearance, so there's a certain amount of air that just goes right underneath. And there's a certain amount of air that goes over the top. You know, these the free streams so if you think about like a volume of air that you're traveling through, it all starts off coming together, but these streamlines have to go faster in order to meet up and cover uh, the, the, this larger distance over the surface of the vehicle. That actually generates lift. And automotive engineers are very familiar with that. So as, you, as you're moving around at low speeds, it really doesn't matter too much because the lift that you get is fairly negligible because the change in velocity um, is fairly negligible. But as you start going to the high speeds, you know, cars, trucks, trains, everything, you know, that's sitting on the ground actually starts to produce quite an amount of lift because you've got, you know, a good amount of air can get underneath and it causes a fairly large pressure differential and that, you know, upsets the, you know, it upsets the apple cart and bad things happen. Your, your car gets lighter, weight comes off of the wheels and you lose steering, 
um, you lose traction, you uh, it changes your dynamics, you know, all sorts of things happen. The vehicle does not perform like you want it to, and that's not acceptable. So for a case of the, my very poorly drawn high-speed car here, automotive engineers try to combat that lift by putting the car really low to the ground. So you're limiting the amount of air that can get under the car. And actually, jumping over here, this is a bottom view of a, of a modern high-speed, say, race car. Many of them now go to active aerodynamic systems or, or more, um, more thoroughly thought out underbody uh, aerodynamic passages where you take in a certain volume of air and you narrow it down so you actually speed up the flow here and as I said up here speeding up the flow reduces uh, results in a pressure drop so you using your underbody aerodynamic trays you increase the speed of the flow so you reduce the pressure so you actually create a suction effect that sucks the car down and they discover that you can actually make a very significant amount of downforce you know, using um, aerodynamic structures um, outside of wings and uh, spoilers and that sort of thing. So that's why you see on, let's say, um, on a lot of uh, supercars, you know, big air intakes in the front and then the, the diffusers in the back, you know, because they're actually doing a very, um, a, they're doing a very conscious effort to manage the airflow on the under tray in order to to create a suction that makes downforce. And they're doing that to combat the lift that the car generates. So again, they have to be very careful when they try to balance this because you want to put the aerodynamic center of that um, under tray of aerodynamic features in the right place so that you're putting your uh, downforce where the car needs it. For example, if you're in a rear-wheel drive car and you're putting all the downforce in front, you can actually lose the effectiveness of uh, being able to turn your wheels, or you can make your steering get too hard. Conversely, if you put that uh, suction too far back, then you can actually take away uh, your steering. So now you're going really fast and you can't steer. So you know, these are things that you all have to consider. And this directly applies to our RC cars. Because if as you start to get to those higher speeds, you know, the vehicle is going to start, um, well, air is getting underneath but in the case of my vehicle here, I don't have an aerodynamic under tray. This is a slash LCG body. It's just a big open area. So the air that comes underneath the vehicle will actually slow down. That's bad because that actually will generate more pressure underneath the car, which will amplify a lifting effect. So, so the car will probably will, will try to lift off the ground off its wheels a bit. Now you can counter that with these big freaking spoilers. And that's probably not too bad when you talk about moderate speeds. But when you get to the really high speeds, what's gonna happen is, you know, for a high speed run, these spoilers act like parachutes because, well, hey, if you look at it, it's not the most aerodynamically designed thing in the world. So basically this rear deck of it is really just a flat surface that just stands up and it acts like, like I said, like a parachute. You just have free stream air just banging into this thing. So it creates a lot of drag. And also, spoilers in general are actually wings that are upside down. So if you look at my drawing here, I actually draw it that way. Because the way that they work is they increase, uh, they have uh, increased area, or I should say an increased distance surface from the bottom here that causes the streamlines to go faster going underneath the bottom of it and over the top. And that causes, you know, basically it's a little wing upside down and pushes the car down. But the process of generating lifts isn't free. They call that induced drag. And I won't jump into that. That's more of a aerodynamics tool one concept but wing, wings are not 100 percent efficient you end up having some drag induced by the fact that you are you know generating either lift or downforce and you know if you're trying to get to a top speed you know that is basically just going to be slowing you down it's going to be more drag 
So when it comes time for me to do my uh, top speed runs, I'm probably going to take this uh, airfoil or the thing in an airfoil, this spoiler thing off. And I may replace it with another spoiler that's uh, lower profile or more air, uh, of more of a true aerodynamic shape, or just get rid of it all together. Because I think that, you know, the vehicle itself is pretty clean for aerodynamically. And even though, like I said, it doesn't have the, the true aerodynamic treatments of an XL1, for example, you know, it's not too bad. Um, but the other major thing to consider with uh, the aerodynamics with the vehicle is your overall drag. And I alluded to it. But if you go back to my example of sticking my hand out in a free stream, what I'm actually feeling is called stagnation pressure. So the force of the molecules hitting my hand or actually causing them to stop moving. And that force I feel is actually equal to stagnation pressure equaling the aerodynamic drag times the coefficient of drag, which is, um, coefficient of drag is basically a, an efficiency term that says how easily are the air molecules moving around the surface that I'm hitting. And um, so a more clean aerodynamic shape like this guy right here, you know, it actually has a fairly low coefficient of drag because the air molecules don't have to expend a lot of energy in order to go over. It just, they flow very smoothly over the shape. By contrast, if you look at this guy here, this truck body, and this is not a really bad aerodynamic shape, but you have a lot of blunt surfaces here. So surfaces are going to hit this and then they have to arc, turn this corner. And they're coming up here and then there's a sudden drop off here. That's actually going to cause tumble. Tumbling air um, acts like, um, it, acts, it basically makes a little pocket that um, air can now flow over, but that it, it makes, uh, it disrupts the streamlines going through and it causes a little bit of drag. Going over to the body here, you have a sudden drop off of the body here. And you can see that, you know, this isn't a standard pickup truck shape. So they put this aerodynamic shell to try to make the air flow easier over it. But still, you know, you've got a high pickup and low, I and mean, then a big drop off. That's going to create a big area of suction on the back here. And that acts like a parachute. So this shape is not going to be as aerodynamically efficient as this shape, which has more subtle changes and smoother. So drawing that out more explicitly, if you look at this drawing here, so here you have a three-dimensional drawing of a, a rough, you know, rough drawing of a, of a car shape. You have this is a representation of the cross-sectional area of this vehicle shape here that is effectively looking at the vehicle directly back here. This is how the wind sees your car. Putting this body next to it. Same thing. This is how the wind sees your car. And to the car, or sorry, to the wind, this shape is all that matters. So air comes here, hits it directly, and goes over. Every little bump, every little protrusion, that causes air to expend a little bit more energy to get around those things. Those cause drag. Over here, you see, even though this is just a model, so it's not a pure representation, there's a lot fewer disruptions in the airflow. That makes a more aerodynamically clean shape. That makes it inherently lower drag. And also, even though this guy is wider, you know, it's actually a lower cross-sectional area. So before I started filming here, I did some quick calculations, and you see that the F1 body here, you know, with a width of about 12 and a quarter inches, and this is a little overestimate, it's actually a little bit less than that, but a ride height of about six and a half inches initially, before I dropped it even further down to the ground, I had about 79.6 inches total cross-sectional area. That was including the space underneath the car. When I subtracted the underbody gap, um, that now turned into a cross-sectional area of about 69 square inches. And that's not completely accurate because I didn't take into account the, act, the additional area of the wheels underneath here, but that's just basically the body itself. Okay, for the sport truck body, you know, similarly, I ended up initially with 
84 square inches, but when I subtracted off uh, the, uh, the basically the free space underneath the car, I ended up with about just 71 square inches for the body. So you see, they're actually pretty close from a cross-sectional area point here. So, so the wind looking at them, and I can just show from here, this guy at this angle is not very much, not very much larger than this guy. So, but coming up a little bit and just looking at the shapes of the body, you can see that the air just has to do a whole more, a lot more work going around. Like things like this, where you have the white fenders and coming in and the flare and then flaring back out again. Now that looks really nice and it's more aerodynamic than just having a wheel just sticking out, banging against the air. But each of these curves cost you something. Back here, this becomes a negative pressure region. That, that's like a drag chute. And you hit here and then it makes another drag chute. Now, like I said, it's better than some of the alternatives, but not the most efficient aerodynamic shape. This guy right here, on the other hand, uh, it's still got some little things here and there that, um, you know, end up costing you a little bit, but from an A to B comparison, you know, this is much more attuned to the high speed running. Plus it just looks good. So I hope I didn't bore you, but um, you know, it's just little things that you need to, or uh, things that a lot of guys, quite frankly, they don't have access to this information. So part of the point of this channel is to you know, try to help put information out there readily for people that you know, they usually uh, don't usually have a chance to see or interact with or, or deal with. So, and this is all available on the internet, but you know, part of getting knowledgeable is figuring out the right questions to ask. So now you can do a Google search and look up the Bernoulli principle and um, look at some of the more uh, detailed treatments on pressure losses and the aerodynamics in cars. And that it helps you get a much better idea about what's important to you or what becomes important when you start getting to these higher speed ranges. I mean, like again, you know, a lot of this stuff you know, really doesn't matter when we're talking about just tooling around at 30 miles an hour in the parking lot. Aerodynamics don't really come into play at all. But when you start getting to 60, 70, 80, you know, you can, the forces being applied to these cars become pretty darn impressive. I mean, for example, it's a six pound car and it's going to be, you know, experiencing, you know, somewhere in the order of between four to seven pounds of drag. And I putting a big question mark on that just because I don't have a clear, a good idea of what the true coefficient of friction is for this vehicle. So I'm actually going to be trying to measure that uh, with my power meter uh, when I go out. So by doing a, um, by measuring the amount of, of power consumed by the car, I can get an estimate of the total drag that is being, being felt by the motor. And then using some uh, mathematical trickery, I will try to give, to try to separate out the mechanical drag versus the aerodynamic drag. And then from there, I will be able to do a rough estimate of what the coefficient of friction is for this vehicle and for my rustler and for this body as well. So that's just gonna be more data to allow me to crunch more numbers and you know, hopefully better understand how the vehicle will, or how the vehicle's performing. And, and let me do other things like benchmark power systems, benchmark bearings, um, benchmark other components, look at the rolling resistance of wheels. Now, I mean, once you have a, a baseline of knowledge, then you can deviate and look at all sorts of stuff. So I think there's lots of fertile ground to plow here. So I will keep you guys informed, keep you posted, and you know, hopefully you guys find this interesting and maybe even a little bit useful. All right, so again, maybe a little bit more long-winded than I intended, but I hope you guys enjoy it, and feel free to post some comments and let me know what you think about the new car, or I should say the new body, and, um, you know, and the goals, or just if you have questions. All right, you guys, have a good night. Happy New Year once again, and uh, our House 21 signing off, and remember to fly, fix, fly. Get out there, run it, break it, fix it, and do it all over again. 
All right, you guys take care.